Uh, hi guys, my name's Arjun Nanda and I am uh, go to Concord Carlisle High School in Concord, Massachusetts. I'm Madison Toomey, I go to La Jolla Country Day School in San Diego. I'm Megan Gramling and I go to Laguna Hills High School. And today we're going to be talking about the permafrost microbiome. So this is our abstract. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because we're going to explain um, it in the presentation, but basically our project deals with permafrost, which is chronically frozen ground, and how it is thawing due to increased global temperatures because of climate change. And um, this is causing increased release of methane that's trapped in the permafrost. And the goal of our experiment is to see if the um, methantrophic bacteria, which is bacteria that consumes methane for energy, can decrease the amount of methane being emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, so before I get into the main concept and topic, I'm going to define what a microbiome is. Uh, we talked about two definitions, the first being um, all the microorganisms that make up a particular environment, and the second being the gen genetic makeup of all those organisms. Um, and now I'm going to define the permafrost. Going off of what Maddie said, it's um, chronically frozen land that uh, for two or more consecutive years um, that includes soil, gravel, and sand um, within frozen ice. And if you hadn't guessed it yet, they're most common in the northern um, locations like Canada, Alaska, Russia, um, and more. And so our main question is how can we change the structure of the permafrost microbiome in order to reduce the emission of methane? And so what's happening right now is due to the rising global temperatures, um, the permafrost ground is beginning to thaw. And then because of this, the plants in the microbiome are releasing carbon, and the archaea within the microbiome are um, taking in the carbon and then releasing methane. Okay, so for the social context, uh, carbon dioxide and methane are both greenhouse gases. However, methane is much more harmful to the environment, and the increased release of methane into the atmosphere will raise global temperatures even more, which will in return increase the melting rate of permafrost and release even more methane into Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this will essentially trigger an irreversible cycle that will have detrimental effects upon our environment. It is extremely important to address this issue because although people have calculated the potential progression and outcomes of climate change, most of these figures don't account for permafrost thawing, and this will rapidly accelerate the timeline of global climate change. Overall, decreasing the release of methane into Earth's atmosphere can help further decrease climate change, and this proposal could benefit humans in the aspect that global warming could become less of a problem for future generations. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the precedents and some studies that have been done about this topic already. So, so far, scientists that are studying methane emissions from permafrost have been trying to answer questions such as, how much carbon is actually under the permafrost, how fast the methane is being emitted, and what impacts it can have on climate change. And so one of the leading scientists studying this issue, David McGuire, whose picture is right here, um, has estimated that the permafrost contains about twice as much carbon as there is in the atmosphere. And much of that carbon is frozen into the permafrost, so when this carbon is emitted into the atmosphere as methane gas, the effects could be extremely harmful to the environment. And so this image um, on the screen shows the study sites of permafrost completed by, my, by many scientists, mostly in Alaska. And this just proves how much permafrost is in one area of the planet. Um, so this is our product, project proposal. And our solution would be to introduce methanotrophs um, to control the methane emissions. So now I'm going to talk about what they are. Um, so they're bacteria that um, live in extreme environments, um, in areas with limited oxygen, with high methane levels, um, and limited concentrations of nitrogen and copper. Um, these conditions are really similar. Oh, sorry. They um, take in uh, methane as energy. They break it down. Um, and the condi conditions I just described are very similar to that of the permafrost, so they could survive in those conditions as well. Um, they oxidize CH4 methane um, using an enzyme called monooxygenase, whose um, essential cofactor is, in fact, 
copper. So now I'm gonna walk through the project proposal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna first simulate um, permafrost conditions in the lab, and then we're gonna slowly raise the temperature of that simulation, and um, this is without the methanotrophs, and then gather the amount of methane that has been released. And then we're gonna do another simulation um, using ide an identical permafrost uh, simulation, and we're gonna introduce the methanotrophs into this um, beforehand, and then after raising the temperatures, we're gonna see how much methane has been released, if any, and determine the effect that the methanotrophs have on combating uh, the methane emissions. Okay, so moving on to the challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for our proposal is that we're unaware of the amount of copper that's within the permafrost environment. And copper plays an important role in assisting the enzyme monooxygenase uh, deteriorate the methane and it's necessary to react. Um, another challenge is human interaction with territories containing permafrost uh, causes the permafrost to thaw even quicker and release methane and carbon dioxide at a much faster rate. Uh, the image on the way right shows um, homes in Siberia on top of permafrost, and the human interaction with the permafrost forces it to thaw rapidly and collapse some of the permafrost and results in a shift of the land. And then lastly, a third challenge is obtaining enough methanotrophs to properly execute this experiment because there is a limited number available. And then also the last challenge is actually implementing the methanotrophs into the um, permafrost environment. Okay, so for the time being, we suggest solely testing the methanotrophs on methane and soil in artificial permafrost in the labs to determine the effectiveness and impacts that this proposal could um, have on the environment. And we wanna utilize the electron microscope to analyze a sample of methane that would be frozen with cryo-EM to simulate a similar extreme temperature that the methane experiences within permafrost. And next, with a combination of methanotrophs and copper, we would um, place a small sample of the methanotroph copper mixture on the methane sample to witness the reaction between the variables. So if this works, we will incorporate the methanotrophs into the actual permafrost microbiome, which will hopefully reduce the overall methane emission that comes from the melting permafrost. Um, these are contributions and our references and sources, and that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Why is methane bad for the environment? <laughs> Do you wanna go first? Um, so methane, is a greenhouse gas, and when it's emitted, um, it goes into the atmosphere, and so like usually the atmosphere insulates the planet, so it like traps the sun's rays um, to keep us like warm and to regulate the temperature. But if there's too many greenhouse gases that could um, in the atmosphere that could affect the um, temperatures, which is what we're seeing with climate change right now. Um, so we're gonna, um, af in the lab, we're gonna take a sample of the first simulation and sort of like freeze it or get it to the temperature and using cryo EM and see the makeup of all the microorganisms. And then we're gonna take the sample from the second simulation with the introduced bacteria. And we're gonna see if there are any like detrimental impacts of introducing the bacteria and how like it really affects all the other microorganisms in the microbiome as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So like a control and the experiments we do. <coughs> so um, do you know what happens with the methane when Um, <laughs> so what would happen is um, it releases carbon dioxide, but then that would cycle back into the, 
which you know is a greenhouse gas, but that would cycle back into the um, archaea and it would break down. So it would kind of be just like a big cycle of breaking down gas and then another organism would take it in and then it would release and break in. So it's kind of just like a new cycle. Yeah, the archaea would break it down. Those were just um, like the basically just a ge geographical map showing like the different heights <laughs> and like the peaks of the um, permafrost microbiomes that weren't like it wasn't like too like complicated or anything. So like, like yeah, yeah, it was like how much like permafrost is in each area and like as the colors got um, like closer to like green and blue, that was where more of like the um, actual like super deep permafrost is, and then closer to red and orange was less permafrost. Any more questions? So, I have a question. Um, what, uh, when you look at your samples, are you gonna do anything in particular to sort of mark out the modified cells versus the natural cells of the, of the microbiome in your samples? How will you identify whether it just looks like there's more bacteria total versus more bacteria from your type versus there's only a few bacteria but 100% of them are your modified bacteria, right? How do you tell what's native versus what's your engineered bacteria? We could, in the second sample, we could introduce like the like fluor fluorescent protein to make it apparent which like which ones are the methanotrophs, so that we're not just like counting all the bacteria. Right. So you'd want to use fluorescent microscopy first, and then do the electron microscopy instead. Yes. about 30 seconds, right, where you can actually use energy, energy dispersion x-ray detection to map out elements, especially mm -hmm. metals, so that you theoretically see bacteria that are ingesting and processing or metabolizing carbon would have a localized signature of carbon in that, or, or sorry, copper yeah. in that group. It would also give you a way to analyze the actual copper content in your sample. Mm -hmm whether or not they're, if your simulated permafrost maps onto real permafrost, give you a control there, and also to see is it degrading over time. Because there's these sort of finite amounts of copper in the environment, mm -hmm. even though you have this cycle 